Hocus Pocus has become one of the definitive Halloween movies for a generation. But it wasn't supposed to be. In fact, Disney had very little faith in the film, and in a year where the company was releasing two Halloween movies, the studio chose to highlight only one, tossing Hocus Pocus to the side. So, what happened? How did the Sanderson sisters become so popular? And how did the movie go from a failure to a cult classic? My name is Josh Taylor, this is Modern Mouse, and I want to talk about Hocus Pocus, how it was made, how it became a cult classic, and why people still gravitate towards it after all these years. Alright, let me be upfront with my bias right now. I love Hocus Pocus. Where a lot of people see it as kitschy and cheesy, I find it as charming and brilliant. And critics panned it, and there's a lot to critique about this film, and we'll get to that. But first, I want to talk about how this movie was made and why it should have failed. The original premise for the movie was about a black cat who used to be a boy but was transformed by witches. From there, the story evolved into something much darker. A story about a group of kids trying to save Halloween was pitched in 1984 to Disney, and they ended up buying the script. Think of it as Stranger Things, but instead of saving a friend from the nightmarish place like the Upside Down, they were looking to save a friend from the clutches of witches. Hoping to up the production, it was also pitched to Steven Spielberg's Amblin Entertainment, but Spielberg began seeing Disney as competition around that time and opted not to add his name to the film as a producer. From there, the film went through several rewrites because Disney wasn't really interested in a horror movie. Screenwriter Mick Garris added more humor to the script and continued to rewrite it and rewrite it, but the film sat in limbo until 1992 when Bette Midler showed interest. That's not to say that she changed the script. On the contrary, she stated that shooting Hocus Pocus was the most fun that she'd ever had working up to that point. And Bette Midler was a big deal. But before she signed on to make Hocus Pocus, she had been a powerhouse in the entertainment industry. She'd been nominated for Best Actress at the Academy Awards, and had won several other awards at the Golden Globes, the Emmys, the Tonys, and the American Comedy Awards. She sold out arena tours with her music and performed both off and on Broadway. Bette Midler was a bona fide superstar by the time she did Hocus Pocus, and her involvement is what led to the project getting made, and quite honestly, may have been the only reason Hocus Pocus saw the light of day. Rounding out the trio of witches was Kathy Najimy and Sarah Jessica Parker. Najimy had worked with Disney before, and had a major hit the year prior to the release of Hocus Pocus as Sister Mary and Sister Act opposite Whoopi Goldberg. Parker was still young in her career, Despite having a few major roles in films like Honeymoon in Vegas or on the TV legal drama Equal Justice, she was still years away from her breakout role in the HBO show Sex and the City. That made her involvement in Hocus Pocus the least beneficial of the three Sanderson sister stars, at least at that time. The rest of the cast was filled out with a bunch of names that weren't really big stars. For the lead character of Max Dennison, Omri Katz went on to play the part, but originally producers were hoping to get Leonardo DiCaprio, who had just come off of having a good run on the TV show Growing Pains. But he opted to star in the film What's Eating Gilbert Grape rather than in Hocus Pocus. The most notable thing that Omri Katz had done up to that point was a short one season run of the Fox kids show Erie, Indiana. A spooky show that I personally remember, but most people have probably forgotten about, since it didn't have the support of a show like its rival, Who's Afraid of the Dark, which was on Nickelodeon, but I digress. With the cast in place and Kenny Ortega coming on to direct right after doing Newsies, the film started shooting in two different locations. One in Burbank, California, at the Warner Brothers and Disney backlots, and over in Salem, Massachusetts. But once the film got into post-production, Disney had a serious dilemma. At the same time, Henry Selick and his team had been making the stop-motion animated film The Nightmare Before Christmas, and with both movies having a Halloween theme, Disney had to choose which could come out around that holiday. Theoretically, they could have released both within a few weeks of each other, but they felt like that would be sabotaging their own pocketbooks. 
It's a practice that Disney still adheres to today, even with all of the things that they own, like Marvel and Lucasfilm and Pixar and Disney, they try to spread out all of their releases in a calendar year so that one of their movies doesn't really ever have to compete with another. But The Nightmare Before Christmas was the priority. It ended up getting an October 29th, 1993 release, the weekend of Halloween. Meanwhile, Hocus Pocus ended up with a July release. The thought process behind it was that a family-friendly film like Hocus Pocus would still do well in the summer because kids were still out of school. The problem is that 1993's summer release calendar was pretty stacked. Jurassic Park had been dominating the box office, and the same weekend that Disney dropped Hocus Pocus, Warner Brothers put out their family film about a boy that rescues a killer whale called Free Willy. At the box office, Free Willy would end up making $153 million, while Hocus Pocus only made $44 million. But these films just aren't really comparable. Hocus Pocus is clearly a Halloween film, and people weren't interested in seeing a Halloween movie in July. It was just destined to fail in that spot. And due to its July release, it didn't really stick around in movie theaters long enough to even come close to Halloween. And by the time that it ended up on home media, it was January of 1994, once again failing to support the movie. Critics who looked past the strange release of the film panned it for using star Bette Midler in a campy comedy about witches. Renowned critic Roger Ebert gave it his worst possible grade calling it a confusing cauldron in which there is great activity but little progress, and a lot of hysterical shrieking. The consensus among critics was that the movie just didn't live up to how great the cast of these three Sanderson sisters was, especially Bette Midler. At that point, it would seem like any of Disney's live-action movies, a blip on the radar, but that really wasn't meant to be. Something happened to Hocus Pocus in a similar way to what happens every Christmas to old acts like Bing Crosby or Nat King Cole. For a majority of the year, these long gone singers aren't ever talked about, nor is their music ever played on the radio. But as Christmas season comes around, their songs start to get played, and they start outselling and outstreaming contemporary musicians. And it's because their Christmas carols are seen as the definitive versions of those songs. Hocus Pocus was not yet the definitive Halloween classic, but it was one of the few Halloween-themed films that Disney had made. So around Halloween in 1994, the film started airing on the Disney Channel. Then when Disney purchased ABC, it also aired there. Then it would end up on ABC Family, which is now known as Freeform. Each year, the film would gain more and more of an audience, and it grew into a cult classic. While it wasn't seen in theaters in July of 93, it can't be ignored when it's being played all October long on multiple TV stations, and sometimes it's played multiple times a day. On top of the consistent October marathons, Sarah Jessica Parker went on to become one of Hollywood's top stars by the end of the 1990s, due to the success of her show, Sex and the City. An actor, Sean Murray, who played the young Thackeray Binks in the movie, would end up on the show NCIS in 2003, becoming one of its main characters. So the status of these two actors only helped bring more eyes to Hocus Pocus, adding star power to the film long after its release. As the movie grew in popularity, the town of Salem started embracing it, giving tours where the film was shot, and Walt Disney World added the Sanderson sisters to their annual Halloween party in the mid-20-teens. And now, a sequel is being made with the original trio of Midler, Najimi, and Parker nearly 30 years after the original's release. But just playing a movie that has stars in it isn't enough to make the film important or to give it a cult classic status, so what happened and why do so many people still continue to watch Hocus Pocus? In my opinion, the movie comes with a sense of nostalgia and comfort. For a lot of millennials that grew up with the movie, it's a mark that the Halloween season is here when it starts playing on TV. And it's a movie that's easy to sit down and watch, or to even have on in the background, because the plot isn't overly complicated. 
It's about a group of kids who accidentally bring the Witches of Salem back to life, and then they have to defeat them. And that's really it. Plus, it's also highly quotable, and it has memorable scenes like this one. I'm Jay. This is Ernie. How many times I gotta tell you? This is ice. Or I've seen this one rolling around on social media. Oh, look, another glorious morning. Makes me sick. Another major factor is that Halloween is an all ages holiday, but a majority of the entertainment is always veered towards adults. Haunted houses and horror movies are just too scary for kids. And even though there has been a plethora of family friendly Halloween movies in recent years, when Hocus Pocus came out, that wasn't the situation. Its longevity in part comes from the lack of other films within its own genre, and it being a leader in that genre in the first place. The movie also benefits from its timelessness. It isn't a movie packed with technology from the 90s, nor does it rely on lots of CGI that's aged poorly. Hocus Pocus is lucky that the 90s style and aesthetic of grunge and autumn still holds up. Flannels, sweaters, black leather jackets. That was the style then, and it's still in fashion now. And the decor and Halloween costumes rely less on pop culture of the time, and more on classic outfits that still hold relevance. I think this is what allows younger viewers to connect with the movie. They don't have to question what a Sega Genesis is, or why Max's parents own a car phone. None of that matters to the story. Hocus Pocus has been around for a majority of my life, and I don't know what Halloween would really be like without it. Whether or not I end up watching it every year doesn't really matter, because it's a part of pop culture. It's a movie that inspires excitement for Halloween, because it's spirited, silly, and campy, and most of all, it's fun. It makes Halloween more fun. So. Turn on your TV, light your black flame candles, put on your coziest sweater. It's time to watch Hocus Pocus. Thanks for watching this video. If you enjoyed this one and you want to learn more about some Halloween Disney stuff, you can check out my history of Disney's version of Sleepy Hollow right here. And if you have not, make sure to subscribe to the channel because I do all kinds of TV and film analysis and history all the time, especially Disney. And in the meantime, my friends, thanks for watching, and as always, keep moving forward.